There we go. Maybe it was maybe it was me. I think it was operator error there. The first and greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. As we think about this, let's turn to John chapter 4, and we're going to see what Jesus, what Jesus does when he interacts with someone who is very different and someone that he should have uh, no uh, interaction with, okay? So John chapter 4, we have this starting in verse 7. We're just going to read seven of these verses. Then a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone off in the city to buy food. Now, what had happened was they were traveling. Uh, they had the opportunity to travel either around the area of Samaria. So if you picture Jesus lived in Galilee, the temple was in Jerusalem. Most of the interaction, negative interaction he had with the Pharisees and those arguments and all, that was down here in Jerusalem. He had just had some tense time in Judea with these ones who considered themselves religious and perfect. And he was now, he should have, by the Jewish, he should have gone around Samaria, but he surprised the apostles and said, we're going to go through here. Let me tell you how different uh, this is, why this is such a big deal. The Jews considered, even though they're right part of Israel, they considered this not holy land. So they said that wasn't even part of our country. They said there's another country in the middle of our country. That's how much they hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans had a long history of mistreating or being uh, uh, antagonistic to the Jews as well. Hundreds of years earlier, they had sided with the Assyrians when the Assyrians were ruling over the Jews, and they even intermarried, and they made this new race called the Samaritans. So that's some of the background here. But Jesus says, no, we're not going to go around. We're going to go straight through here. And then... He, and we believe John was probably with him while he sat there, he said, I'm going to go to this well where it's about 6 o'clock at night now. I'm going to go to this well, and I'm going to uh, wait here while you go and get the food. And it was about a half mile they went away to the uh, little city there to get some food. And he sits down at 6 o'clock. Now, uh, it's around this time of the evening. There's nobody else at the well because um, <clears throat> at this time, most of the women had come at other times to draw the water. And so here, this woman from uh, Samaria comes out to the, to the well, and this woman is here at this time because she can't be around decent people. She's known as an immoral woman. She had multiple affairs. She was now living with her fifth husband or, or relationship, and she had to come to this when the married women and the decent women were not around because they wouldn't have even stood next to her. Now, in the culture, on top of the Samaritan, on top of the, on top of the culture, on top of the history, uh, this woman also was not the one for Jesus to interact with because men didn't talk to women that way. They just didn't talk to women. As a matter of fact, it was illegal to teach a woman the law. So we have in here a whole uh, different approach, don't we? I mean, he's dealing with like all the taboos right here in this one story. So he and John are sitting there tired. This woman, who he's not supposed to speak to, comes there to drink water. Let's read on now to our story. So uh, verse 9, the Samaritan woman asked him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. Okay, got that picture. Jesus answered her, if you knew about God's gift of eternal life and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with. No bucket and rope. How, the well is deep. When, where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? Now, let me just say here. And as we think of our own um, sensitivities to uh, talk about race or about sexism or any of those things, uh, understand that often one of the problems is we say things that would set the other side off uh, even though we're trying to work towards peace. And in this case, this woman uh, has just said to a Jewish person something very bad. Uh, the Samaritans actually had their own religion. They said, we are uh, not going to your temple. They built their own temple even. And in this, they also claimed that Jacob, who is, the word is Jacob is Israel, that's the name of the country, is their father. So can you imagine to the Jew who says, no, this woman just says, your father, our father is Jacob. In other words, he's ours, not yours. 
And so when she said this, Jesus could have engaged with her about this sensitivity, about this wrong thing to say. And instead, Jesus stays on this same message. Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. But the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water satisfying his thirst for God, welling up, continually flowing, bubbling within him to eternal life. And the woman says, sir, give me this water so that I will not get thirsty nor have to continually come all the way here to draw. So this is the start of this wonderful story. Jesus answers her with love. Jesus interacts with her against all cultural wisdom at the time, and this is the conversation we join in here at this time in our country's challenging time, dealing with all of the complexities and the difficulties around uh, loving your neighbor today. So as we think about this uh, here, one of the other things you might notice is in verse 9, the Samaritan woman asked him, how is it that you being a Jew asked me a Samaritan woman for a drink? Now how did she know he was a Jew? All he is, he and John we believe are sitting at the well. She comes out, well how would she know looking the way? The, the skin color was a little different. The, the appearance was different. The clothes were different. What he wore and the, so all of those things we believe made it clear to her this was a Jew is the Samaritan. In light of that, I want to take this picture of how Jesus dealt with this Samaritan woman, and I want to see if we can learn from it maybe three simple uh, applications to our current circumstance so that we, like Jesus, love our neighbor, as the Scriptures say. The most important thing we would want to do is to be like our Savior, right? The whole idea, the whole reason you're a Christian is because you love Christ. He's the center. He's the whole center of the faith. So anything he's like, we want to replicate. So as we look at this, let's look very practically at how loving our neighbor may be uh, something we've got to consider in light of a couple of different circumstances. One, let's think of the immigrant. Now, when I was a policeman, I was a policeman in Washington, D.C., and I worked narcotics for uh, most of my career. And I won awards for arresting criminal, uh, criminal illegal immigrants. So people that were here illegally and then committed crimes. They committed crimes, they sold drugs, they uh, uh, did violence or whatever. And so when we would arrest these guys, and that was my job to arrest them, I uh, was awarded for doing this so well. Now I'm a pastor, or even then, while I was working to arrest criminals, I then would go and go serve at a local jail or at a a jail on a mission trip. And that seems like that's very strange. Why would a policeman who is arresting illegal immigrants now say that we should love the illegal immigrant or the legal immigrant here? Why, Why would I say that? Well, because I, when I'm a policeman, I am a policeman. I have a job to do. I am required to do certain things, certain functions. However, what I'm required by my faith is to do these things, whatever it is we're called to do, we do this in this idea of loving our neighbors, our Savior's told us. So then when I'm not a policeman, I would spend my time now caring about those people that are living around me. Some of those people may be Uh, illegal aliens. Maybe they're undocumented. Maybe they're documented. Maybe they're different than me. Maybe they have a uh, accent. Uh, All the things that are difficult for us as they try to integrate in our culture. And all those things I look at completely different because I'm not required to consider whether or not whether or not somebody is in whatever status with our country because I'm I'm just a Christian. I'm just a pastor. I'm here to obey the scriptures and to love our neighbor, even as ourselves. We are to consider and and empathize with those and and their circumstance, whatever those folks that we're interacting with. So for me, when I see people that are younger, I see such difference in the way they think and the way they... So I could easily find ways to 
disagree with them and then not want to spend time with them. But instead, because of Scripture, because of what Jesus has said, we are to love our neighbor. For me, I could say, hey, I was a policeman. I'm not messing with criminals. I'm not messing with people who have uh, come here illegally. So I'm not going to have anything to do with them. But I can't do that because the Scriptures say, love your neighbor as yourself. So what it tells me is that I must think about the condition or the situation, say, for an undocumented person here in our country. If you think about uh, what it took to get there, Mo most people who came here undocumented spend in the neighborhood of five, six, seven thousand or more for each family member who came here from, let's say, Central America. They paid that to some illegal guy who got them a way to go physically from Central America here, and they didn't come by plane. So almost every story of an undocumented person is a challenging story. Many of them living this way, uh, carrying kids with them through this. My daughter just went uh, away for a couple of days, and, and she had four kids, and she's coming back in a minivan with four kids, and they hit traffic. And so for a couple of hours, they're stuck in traffic with four crazy little children there to annoy them and drive them crazy. Now, that seems unconscionable. I think, man, I'd rather do anything. Let's fly to the beach. Do anything rather than be... How would it be if you've got to go on land by your two feet, maybe some buses and different things, with little children, night, day, everything, to get up through... Uh, after saving your life savings, usually borrowing from every family member they could, owing people, owing, and all this pressure, and yet a mom or a dad does all of this to get here. I think it's really important that as Christians, if we're going to love uh, the immigrant, it's important to understand lives are not that simple. Many of them uh, also in their own country were doctors and lawyers, and when they come here, uh, they are offered jobs in the janitorial work. Or we had a janitor that we would talk to, and in fact, her husband owned a whole accounting practice back home. You say, well, why would they come here and leave that? Well, life is just not that simple, is it? When you want to care for your children, you'll do anything to save your children. Much of Central America, there's all kinds of reasons why they have to leave Central America. If we were in those conditions, many of us would take the same course of action. It's very important that we understand, I'm not, you're not, by loving the undocumented person, we are not saying that we think there ought to be different laws in the United States. Those are two different subjects. If you're a congressman, if you're a policeman, if you're, you need to obey the laws and enforce them and do what's best. You need to consider what's the best ways to manage all these things. But brothers and sisters, as Christians, we know what we have to do. We're to love. We're to love. What a wonderful thing. I don't have to contemplate, is this the best? Is this? I don't have to. I need to empathize and to love. How about, uh, so we think about this, how about the um, protesters and the police? Give you another one. Pictures in our, in our news and in our culture today that are just, you know, all over. Matter of fact, uh, of taking calls from both sides, Christians, godly, good people, who are very unhappy with the protesters and others very unhappy with the police. So we talk about this. We th listen to this. Hmm, what are we to do? Well, one is to know what our calling is. Our calling is to love our neighbor as ourselves. My calling, my first calling was not to be a policeman. My first calling was not to enforce the laws of this particular country. My first calling is to... Love my neighbor. So as I tell you now, as a white policeman who operated in a city that was majority African-American, um, and I operated in, a, in an environment where most of my coworkers were African-American as well. In light of that, how do I feel when I see uh, animosity between the African-American or much of the African-American um, uh, population and police here? Well, uh, one is it's very important to think of these things and appreciate them if you're going to love people. So one thing is you have to admit and be willing to consider that there is great deep history of distrust between those two. Uh, in my police career, when I started in the late 1980s, I worked in squads. The guys I worked with still were guys who had arrested people right here in Northern Virginia 
uh, African Americans who had wanted to sit in a restaurant that they weren't allowed to. Guys that I worked with right then, one of the first black police officers in the state of Virginia, he worked with me. He was still a policeman. In other words, this is very recent history. And so because of this recent history, we have to understand that there is a long and deep distrust. I was shocked how um, the African-American community felt about me as a white policeman when I would go in. I had no, I mean, I was just out of Bible college. What are you talking about? This, but you can't expect all of history and everything to be solved in two minutes by uh, you being kind or doing this. What we've got to concentrate on is loving our neighbor. During my time as a policeman, um, this whole um, uh, tension around police shootings and all got very real for us as a police department because we had a couple of occasions where African-American officers uh, made arrests and while they were in the middle of making arrests one wonderful story was a guy who was off duty a brave wonderful policeman with his children in his car sees a carjacking runs out in the middle of the street in southeast Washington uh, takes his gun out is attempting to arrest the carjackers and two uh, policemen uh, on duty uniformed policemen see an African-American man with a gun in his hand and they shoot him and he dies right there in front of his kids now he's a he's a wonderful guy he's an absolute hero the guy but he was killed and we all knew both of them right we knew the officers who had done the shooting and we knew the guy had been shot a girl I went to the police academy with she uh was the fastest runner in my academy class and uh, after she had about seven eight years on she was pregnant three four months she went to um uh, out to lunch, to be honest, and she saw a carjacking right in front of her. So she's pregnant, but she's out to lunch, and she's, I have to do something. So she goes, and she, again, she's brave. She's a wonderful policeman. She catches the guys. She has it down on the ground trying to arrest him, and a white policeman in uniform, now she's not in uniform, she's in plain clothes, sees a black female with a gun in her hand attempting to arrest this guy, and he immediately thinks she must be a criminal. They've been called to a robbery scene, didn't know that police were there, and he fires at her. And he hits her in the spine, and she now is uh, been in a wheelchair for the last 25 years. So she's my good friend. One day, we're joking, laughing, everything's fine, and the next day, um, She's in this, and it was all race related. I mean, there's no way I can guarantee you this was something we knew as policemen is uh, when all this was going on as a white policeman, I had it many times. I did not dress like a policeman. I was working in narcotics. And yet if I was out with my gun out making an arrest in an African-American neighborhood and police came, they would normally assume this guy is a policeman. If my African-American coworker did the exact same thing, they would assume he's a thug. That was just a guarantee. When we would carry our guns off duty, we would carry in plain clothes, and so I would go to the mall, and a couple of times I did brilliant things like... Um, once I was standing in line and uh, the gun, I didn't have a holster and the gun slid down my pants and it slid out onto the floor and I'm standing in a uh, place of business with a gun on the floor and I've got to reach down and get the gun and try to assure people that I'm really a policeman or something. Let me tell you, if my African-American friends had the same thing happen, there would have been police surrounding the place. We knew this. This was a guarantee. This was part of it. In supervising these guys, I had to tell them, you must wear police, police everywhere. We did everything we could to try to cover them when we did step out, especially our African-American friends. This is a fact. This is the way things are. And so in light of this, I think it's really important to understand this in order to love our neighbor. I'll give you an example that may help too with... Um, Hudson Taylor was this great missionary. He went to China and ended up making world of difference in China and still China Inland Mission um, making impact. Hudson Taylor went there when he first arrived there. He was a British guy coming into China. And the people believed that anyone from another country with that skin color was a devil. And so they threw things. Imagine you're going to give your life to go share and help a country. And the first arrival is people are literally throwing things at you. Even later, there was the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxer Rebellion was that uh, the Chinese believed that the white and foreign devils were the ones uh, ruining the country. So they actually went and killed 
tons of our missionaries and tons of our... So you say, well, wait a minute. So this man was hated just because of where he was from and how he looked. What did Hudson Taylor do with this? Did he spend his life uh, arguing against Chinese um, racism? Did he spend his time defending himself and uh, forgetting all about them? No. In fact, what he did was he went home and he got more missionaries to go back. And the problem he had was he loved them. He loved them. And when you love your neighbor, you're able to put up with all kinds of things. So maybe we'd be willing to put up with learning different ways to talk to each other. Jesus uh, was not offended or did not harp on this thing when the Samaritan woman said, Jesus continued to talk to her about what he cared about with her because he loved her so much. He could see beyond that. So even as you and I try to be a multicultural church or we try to live godly lives in an area where we are full of immigrants and people of all color, and people of all background, people of all orientation, all those things, we need to understand and hear the words from our Savior ringing in our ears as we start to think, well, they shouldn't do that and they shouldn't do that and they shouldn't say that and they shouldn't. Why not instead, why not instead Listen, empathize, and take whatever precautions you can to be sensitive and empathetic to those that are different. This is the requirement of real love. On a mission trip, I have seen my brothers and sisters do things that would be, oh my gosh, so sacrificial. We used to go to a dump uh, in uh, Mexico. And when we go to this dump, you literally, you'd have to climb this, this mountain up to get into the dump. And then you'd have sewage. You have, uh, it was just horrible. And it's working with a group of folks in the dump who work in the dump, who live near the dump. And we would walk through that filth and do that. Why? Because we loved those working there and we wanted to share the gospel. Bring that same group home and ask them to love uh, a bunch of protesters or a bunch of police or a bunch of undocumented people, and we've got all kinds of reasons why that doesn't work. That just doesn't make sense, brothers and sisters. If we can do that kind of sacrifice for people we love, boy, we could sure do some sacrifice here in terms of what we say, how we listen. Maybe we need to say less and focus in more on how much we care and love people. This is the least of what we do in, in living the life that Jesus has asked us to. The wonderful thought, Philippians 2, 4, he says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So when you go into situations where you don't know even, maybe you're nervous, you're the last thing you want to do is offend. Uh, one is, I would tell you, to um, think a lot about what the other is worried about. This is the way we love our neighbors. We're thinking of the others. Jesus was thinking of the Samaritan woman when he brought the gospel to her. Shocked John, shocked the apostles. But he was willing to do this because he loved her so much. The last thing I'll tell you is this. Look at verse 39 of here, chapter 4. It says, now many Samaritans from that city believed in him and trusted him as Savior. Boy, this Samaritan woman... This woman went and testified to the others, and you're not going to believe this, but many other Samaritans, these different people who are cursed and who are so anti everything Jewish and the Jewish so anti them, were going to make up the early church. What? I, you just cannot even conceive of this kind of difficulty that they would have experienced. This was Jesus' recipe for his church. What a wonderful picture. Why did Jesus say, why did he have the Jews for years every day would say this mantra over again, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. They would do this every day. Why? Because it's so central to us uh, moving forward with this wonderful message of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, the last picture I give you is this. In order to love our neighbors, let's do what Jesus said here. Jesus said here, he said, uh, and when he saw the multitudes, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless without a shepherd. You know the verse. You've heard it many times. Did you realize 
That verse was written. That story happened while he was looking at who? A group of Samaritans that that woman was bringing back to the well. So it changes the story, doesn't it? Jesus had eyes in his head that the other apostles didn't have. All the other apostles saw was a group of unwanted, very different, hated group of people coming back towards them, but not Jesus. He saw them and he had compassion. Brothers and sisters, this is what I'd say for you to do. When you're watching the television and you want to throw something at it for whatever thing has happened on there, whether it makes one side or the other, I'm telling you as a Christian, we need an eye transplant. Try to get Jesus' eyes in your head for a minute. And look at the crowds and pray for the protester. Pray for the policeman. Pray for those that are struggling. Pray for the undocumented. Pray for all the different parts of society that are struggling. And, and care and think this is the eyes of Jesus. May I have compassion, such compassion, that I can have an acceptance of those that are around me. If you are in a position where you need to make certain decisions, if you're the policeman or you're the protester or whatever, then make them in light of God's word. Do as best as you can in light of what you know in Scripture. But for most of us that are on the outside of that watching this, brothers and sisters, let us obey the tenets of our faith. The, the key tenet, he said, the first and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second greatest commandment of all the things Jesus tells us, of all the things you work on, holiness and uh, kindness to others and all those things, Jesus says the second most important thing you can work on is loving your neighbors, yourself, brothers and sisters. We can do that, right? We can do that. We can do that. Let's pray together and let's ask God that he so changes us that we truly can love our neighbor as ourselves. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thanks so much that you, O oh Lord, are so gracious. Thank you, Jesus, for a wonderful faith that even in difficult times, when we have people being different than us, Lord, may you deliver us from worrying about who they support or what their background is. And, and instead, Lord Jesus, that we would care and listen to their background, to listen and to understand and not to bring with us our own prejudices, our own background, our own history, but instead we would come with compassion to see people as you see them. And with everything in all of our heart, our main purpose would not be to solve every problem that we think there is in the country today, but instead that we would be focused on loving our neighbors, ourselves, and those of us, Lord, who can do something to stop the things that are wrong all around us. May we also, Lord Jesus, step into the way to protect those that are being mistreated, uh, to ask you, Lord, to help us to love our neighbor in every way we can, in every way we can. And here as we serve you together, May we have eyes of compassion to see the world, to see each person as you see them. We pray this, Lord, and we thank you. We pray that today we would learn much about you and much about how we could learn to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.